Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds, and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Welcome to our podcast, where we bring you the most inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and experts in the software development industry. And each week, we interview successful leaders who share their unique journeys and valuable insights. I'm your host, Barry, and today we're joined by a remarkable guest, uh, Marco Bjornovic, who is CEO and co-founder at Swiss Mile. Hello, Marco. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, and I'm happy for having me here on this call. Lovely. We're very appreciative of your time. I know you're very busy, so it's great that you've taken time out of your day to speak with us. Um, anyone who doesn't know you, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and the company that you work at? Yeah, as you already correctly said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Swiss Smile. So that's a mobile robotics company uh, where we're specializing on embodied AIs, where we basically connect AI technology with the physical world. So our AI can understand the real world and guide an autonomous robots to do various tasks. And that's what we do. Have you always been interested in like robotics, that kind of thing? Yeah, so my journey in robotics started uh, around 10 years ago, and I immediately went into this called legged robotics space. So imagine robots with legs, and you have to somehow uh, understand how you control each of the joints of the robot so that the robot can walk around in the physical space. In the beginning of my journey, we were mostly working with some traditional methods in our space called like motion control, motion planning. And then let's say five, six years ago, we, for the first round time, run like artificial neural networks on these machines, which became for us a, re- a game changer when we saw for the first time something like that running on the real world. Are there been any like uh, surprises for you along your journey, things that you didn't expect? Uh, or has everything gone pretty much like clockwork? Uh, I mean, there's, I mean, robotics is so hard. I mean, there's like, I can count like everyday uh, situations where things go wrong and where things need to be readapted. I mean, um, it's quite exciting time now because I would say for four or five years, the first five years of my robotics journey, there were so many unknowns, question marks for how we could solve certain autonomy problems of these super versatile articulated machines and actually since we are deploying AI technology these artificial neural networks we for the first time see like an uh, a light at the end of the tunnel where we can actually imagine that these robots will work in the real world and but along the way I think the challenge in our space is I mean you introduce with the software component so we do a lot of software but we always have hardware involved so Dealing with hardware, uh, scaling hardware, it's, it's super challenge, takes much, much more time. And the iteration cycles are so much slower. So that makes gives us like a, almost daily challenges. Could you talk us through like some of the applications um, that you've been working on and, and like how they apply in like real world scenarios? Yeah. So we have a special kind of machine. First of all, uh, we combine like wheels and legs on our robot. It helps us to combine the best of both worlds. We have like this ultimate mobility platform that can on one hand overcome any obstacle, but it can cover large areas. Um, It's much more efficient. So we are five times more energy efficient than a traditional legged robot by utilizing wheels. Uh, We have five times longer battery times, 10 times more coverage in terms of distances that we can do. So this actually helps us to open up new markets because we have seen by interacting with some of the clients, hey, there's certain use cases where you need a lot of throughput, where the robot has to constantly work. And with a legged robot, you run out of battery and it's not feasible. Then you have wheeled robots that get stuck as soon as you have certain kind of charging terrain. And now all of a sudden we have a mobility platform that can do it all. And uh, if you think about use cases, let's say security patrol where you have to do 24-7 checking if a facility is okay, um, if the machines are still running, or is the fence okay, is the doors open or something like that. Uh, For that, you need this additional capabilities that I just mentioned. And then same on logistics. I mean, yes, our environments are mostly flat, but then for the last 100 meters, when you want to go into a house or anything, 
you have ever read these challenges of uh, having a robot cope with the real world. So there's like a quite an interesting uh, fit of our platform for these kind of use cases. In terms of like the verticality, so like stairs, lifts, going up. So I think like we all kind of know like wheels, uh, they don't like stairs, for example. So in terms of overcoming this like verticality, do you have that ability to overcome it? Or is that something that we're working on? Yeah, so actually this was the main aspect at our research time at ETH Zurich. It's when we the first time put these wheels in, how can the robot autonomously like decide when to drive or when to step? And we spent a lot of time in there. We went a long way. And where we are today is that for us, going over some stairs, it's like uh, easy nowadays. So we have all the answers for that. So now we can think one level above it, not just how to overcome the stairs, but how to be autonomous in a general way. So in this sense, the answer is yes, we have the answers today and we are already, the robot is already going up stairs at the client side, for example. And how do you like check to make sure that the robot is doing or acting in the way that it's supposed to? Do you like have a check the checker kind of um, process in place? Like how do you come to the conclusion that your robots are running efficiently the way that they need to? Yeah, so there are many different ways. I mean, similar to let's say in software engineering, you have a lot of test script on the software, making sure that your software is producing what you want. And this, what you want is defined by us or more or less indirectly by what the clients want. And then we have also this full integration pipelines where um, let's say you have a robot in the field at a client. We have the same setup here at our premise where we test any updates to the robot, making sure that it fully works. So. There's all this infrastructure that is built around making sure that whatever new developments uh, we want to deploy at the client client side, that it goes for a rigor, a rigorous testing. I think like a profession like yours is probably really fascinating to do. I can't imagine anything more exciting than robotics. I think it's it's definitely something that catches the interest of the, of the layman. What tech trends are currently like catching your attention within your industry and like what are the driving factors behind their significance? Yeah, I, I think at the moment there's such a big interest coming into robotics uh, from all sides. And I think what the interesting part is, and I've been uh, thinking about this topic a lot, why is it now? Or maybe this conclusion is even wrong and we say the same thing in five years, but at the moment, I feel like there is a change to, let's say, 10 years ago, five years ago, of how many people see robotics. And there are many different trends that were going on in the past that now converge to a good point of where we can actually deploy these robotics machines. On one hand, the whole industry um, around, let's say, the iPhone, like these kind of products helped in our supply chain of the manufacturing to make these robot ma machines cheaper on one hand. Then the whole trend in autonomous driving helped us to develop new kinds of sensor technologies, make them better, make them cheaper as well. Similar sensor technologies in an autonomous car we're using on our autonomous robots, right? And then the whole infrastructure, I think infrastructure is being a little bit disregarded when I uh, mention it. Because let's say five, 10 years ago, if I wanted to run, let's say, a deep learning algorithm, I had to run it on like a local GPU. Maybe I had a team to build my own server room where I can maybe automate some of these processes. And nowadays we're in a time where through the chat GPT trend, there's so much development into data centers. Uh, so it's become very convenient to train these neural networks uh, on AWS, Microsoft, Azure, and others um, in the market. So this combination of low-cost hardware, high-performance, low-cost um, sensors, and um, scaled-up infrastructure for AI training helps us actually to come to this moment where we can put everything together and work on the robotics problem. Have there been any like surprises in store in terms of AI? Is there anything like you're working on kind of now? I mean, you don't have to get into specifics, but generally working on um, that, like an ongoing project or any endeavors like that? Yeah, 
I mean, uh, the groundbreaking moment was, so we were at ETH Zurich five, six years ago, and there were um, two researchers there uh, that made quite an impact. Uh, and it was Jamin Wangbo and, uh, and also Jun Ho Lee. And they were the first one to run like artificial neural networks on these legged robots in our lab. So we were a lab of maybe 20 people that were working on robotics in general. They had the courage to try out for the first time these artificial neural networks. And the whole lab was witnessing for the first time running that something like this was running on the real robotics machine. And this was for me the game changer because it looked so natural. It was super robust. This machine wouldn't be, you couldn't be able to make it fall. It solved already many of the problems where we had no solution about how to solve it, like simple things that the robot how the robot behaved. And let's say our team was quite lucky to witness this. And since that moment, a lot of people in the lab switch, switched to this new technology of training or doing deep uh, deep learning methods on these robotics problems. And I think every time we apply these neural networks for a new task, we are surprised like children watching the robot, how it, how it, for example, grabs a package, opens a door. We once grabbed the package with the wheels. Let's say the robot stands up on two legs. It Instead of having a wheels on legs, it had wheels on the arms. And then it used actively the, the wheels to grab a package and manipulate it. And all of these things, we like we had no idea that you could do something like that. So all of this was like very fascinating to see. Have you ever had any expectations from stakeholders or customers that they were probably a little bit unrealistic, or were they were they like downplaying it? Were they not? They didn't realize how actually effective or efficient that robotics could be. Yeah, it really depends. So if there are certain clients, maybe that. Uh, never interacted with some real robots uh, that have a certain expectations that is coming from media or movies where people think are ah, these robot machines are already as capable as a human mm-hmm. there you can have um, the situation where people think oh like uh, we thought that you're more advanced but actually with most of the clients that we interact with they understand robotics and they have been trying out robotics for the first time i just came back from a client in Singapore, they were testing over the last five years many different robotics machines. And when he saw what our robot did, which none of the robots before were able to conquer, they were very surprised. And this was due to these deep neur- deep uh, learning methods that we were able to deploy and showcase for the client for the first time. And it also changed a little bit the expectation of the client because he thought, wow, this could actually come earlier than we thought. So we have to think about it now. How can we actually leverage those new tools? Have you ever had a stakeholder or a customer like surprise you in the way that they've applied the use of your robotics? Wow, there's so, there's so many. <laughs> we get like daily inquiries from clients uh, from due to our success on social media. So some videos that we had and also with our recent fundraising round uh, with Jeff Bezos, this also added up a certain kind of news around us. So people are contacting us. There are lots of remarkable ideas that people have, even all the way to, let's say, using the robot as a wheelchair, helping people that cannot overcome certain terrain anymore since they don't have the ability to walk anymore. People that thought about it, this is a machine that I can use to hike again or something like that. These are like very beautiful ideas uh, where these robots could be applied. I think we are a little bit still too early for these applications, but I think robotics, this is just examples of how robotics can have like uh, quite an impact on the society. I think it's really quite amazing when you, you create something and someone else uses it in a way that you didn't expect or anticipate. And that, that kind of sparks like a revolution in your mind. You start thinking of other things as well. You mentioned you going to Singapore. so. How do you keep up to date with all the changes? Is it actually very easy to keep up to date because you're connected? Or do you have to keep delving and diving and visiting different places to try and keep up to date? Yeah, so for us, it's a very crucial part to stay up to date in the research community when it comes around the AI. 
side of things. And there's currently like a battle for talents everywhere around the world um, to, ma- to get the best talents and to maintain them. I think it's also very important to really not fall in love in the tools that you use because there might be new tools coming up. I mean, I experienced it throughout my time as a PhD. Whatever the first five years of my robotics journey, whatever I used there, I threw away. It stays as an experience, as an uh, know-how that I, additional know-how that I have, but I use different tools. So it's very important to understand what are the tools around and which tools help for which problems. And to have that kind of know-how is very important. So I imagine in your field, you're not the only company um, specializing in robotics, but what makes you different or stand out from the other competitors? Yeah, it's on one hand, um, the platform that we talked, that I already mentioned, the combination of the wheels and legs, which made like uh, quite a difference. And then also the way how far advanced we are on the training of these artificial neural networks is something that some of the other players in the field maybe started a few years ago or maybe just this year and we were betting in a way our career five years ago on this um, going through that journey of trying to okay this is the game changing moment and we all commit to it and we go after this so there's this time aspect of where we are ahead and i think we are one of the first ones to actually apply it to some of the real world problems that are out there that also makes us in a way special while other people are still like in more of a lab settings of deploying that. But we are really like thinking about large scale deployment with autonomy and the whole, let's say, long tail of problems that come with, with such kind of ambitions. Yeah. And you did mention earlier about your social media presence and watching videos and just for the sake of people who are actually listening to you talking and thinking, well, that sounds quite exciting. How would they go and find your social media? Can you just give us a post so that we will know where to go if we want to see it? Yeah, so you can see some of them on uh, different channels like LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. And they're like scattered around, let's say now our company and the news. If you Google our company, you will see a lot of news. But also from ETH Zurich, the robotic systems lab where we originated from um, with our spin-off. Um, there were also some collaborations with uh, some other YouTube channels where we were also hosted um, as an example. We're talking about the present and the past, but what about the future? What I mean, you don't have a crystal ball, none of us do, but what do you see happening in the future? What kind of potentially exciting events could happen within the robotics field? If I cite some of the expectations of other people in the field, Elon Musk although he always has uh, quite ambitious goals, but he thinks there will be more such kind of robots out there than cars at some point in future. So we're talking about, I think, more than a billion of these kind of machines, hundreds of thousands per year that are being produced. And these are like uh, the numbers. Then there are some big banks that recently, uh, and financial institutions that made some predictions about how big financially this market will be and it's in the order of trillions by 2050 2030 already and if you trust those uh, numbers or these projections it means that out of this maybe pool of startups that exist today these 10 to 20 companies there might be a few that come out of it as becoming the next apple the next google in this market um, in terms of the size. So this is a little bit of where we're heading into. Uh, we as a company, we have the ambitions to play a role. If this is the reality, then we want to play a role in like that as well. You mentioned if you trust those projections. Can I put you on the spot a little bit and ask if you do trust the projections? I'm not the person that comes up with these numbers. So they're more like a top-down approach um, of how to evaluate certain markets. The only insight I can give is, uh, let's say, uh, a bottom-up approach. When I interact with some of the clients and I, per client that I look into and see the challenges and ask them the questions, so how, how often do you have the site? 
or how many of the people are missing for you to maintain this facility. And I just can't look at these numbers. Then I see already a huge potential today. But the missing piece is why don't we have already robotics machines to assist our society to maintain processes and, and, uh, and so forth is because the robotics technology is still not from a technology point of view and from a scaling factor of the production side of things, not at the point there to really fill this void that exists at certain companies. So I don't see, uh, I don't, I didn't find a client yet where I could deploy uh, 1 billion robots, let's say, <laughs> but I already found clients where we are talking about numbers that can go up in the order to 100,000 robots. It's really interesting that you say that. And I kind of think like when I talk to people about robots and AI, one of the issues that often gets raised is the impact on the jobs market. And basically robots and AI will be replacing many, many jobs. And a lot of people have that fear. Do you share that fear or do you see it from a different angle? Our vision is to really work on these mundane, dangerous, strenuous jobs of that people have to do. And let's say I personally come, I worked as a teenager on construction sites in Germany, and it's very hard to find people that want to work on a construction site. It, I came as an immigrant to Germany, and uh, most of the people on the construction site were immigrants from Eastern Europe. Many of the Germans already in the 90s, 2000, didn't want to do this kind of job. So you had to fill this need with, construct, uh, with construction workers um, from outside Germany. Now, over time, let's say my generation, younger generation from Eastern Europe, their standard of living also rose. They don't want to go on the construction site either. So you have to go one step further and maybe Im have immigration even coming from, let's say, further away countries like Asia, maybe Middle East, Africa. But I think hopefully if, if you're doing it correctly, I think this is the right path the standard of living of the whole world should be improved over time. And I think if this really happens, and if this is true, we have to still fill these jobs that nobody wants to do with a robot automation to allow us to keep our standard of living, right? Our standard of living is rising everywhere around the world. So we have to somehow maintain it. And I don't think we can maintain it for a long time if it's only like exploiting let's say cheaper countries in a way that wasn't the answer that i was expecting but it was a great answer i really like the way that you positioned that uh, so we are just coming towards the end of the interview unfortunately but the last question i always like to ask is uh, what advice would you give to someone who is an entrepreneur or who is thinking about becoming an entrepreneur at the early stages i think the most important part i think is surround, uh, surround yourself with uh, people that are somehow smarter or better in certain aspects than you, finding the right mentors that push you also to a certain extent. When I came to ETH Zurich, that was always for, for me like the masterpiece of doing a PhD in, at ETH. When I joined the lab here, I was like surrounded by super smart people. And this is like the environment that you have to build and uh, that you have to immerse yourself in the same way when it comes to building a company. So be open-minded, go out, seek for mentorship, talk to people, try to get as much advice from different people as you can. Because when you are like very, let's say, inexperienced, the first advices that you get, you feel like, oh, that's the answer. But then over time, you actually notice that this was just one answer, but it, it was not maybe the right path. Maybe there was another advice that was better, but you can only uh, get to that point by actually interacting with people and seeking for advice. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that advice and your experiences with us. Marco, I just want to thank you so much again for taking the time to talk with us today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much as well. Yeah. That was Marco Bjelanić, CEO and co-founder at Swiss Mile.